Candice Langford, pelvic and sexual health physiotherapist, and this is The Nurture Pod. We are talking pee, poo, pleasure, pain, periods, pregnancy, postpartum, peri, and postmenopause. All the peas, all supposedly taboo, yet essential to our holistic health and well being. We are shining a light on each and every one of these, both confidently and comfortably. Let's get curious. Trauma, a word that we are hearing more and more, a topic and a subject that you might be very familiar with, a emotion that you might be seeking to distance yourself from. Trauma can present itself and manifest in our bodies, in our lives, on our day to day, or only in certain contexts. And that might present itself very consciously and you might really feel and see and notice the association, or it might be appearing in a very subconscious manner. In practice, I see this showing up as vaginismus, as persistent pain, as constipation, and urinary frequency, and a few others. Today, we are going to speak to Lisa, a psychologist who practices psychotherapy. She utilizes neurotherapies, particularly BWRT and EMI. She's going to teach us and talk to us about desensitizing and processing these experiences, but also how we can start to change the narrative that might be associated with these particular experiences. But first... One of the most common questions that comes my way is how to have better and more satisfying sex. Although this is multifactorial, I so value the potential of erotic audio content to peak mind and body arousal. The audio app Guided by Glow aims to do just that. Their guided sexual meditation journeys gives you the space to slow down, relax and connect you to your senses, your creativity and of course, Nurture your relationship to pleasure as you drop deeply inside the feeling body. Listen until the end of today's episode for a special gift from Guided by Glow. Okay, so let me introduce you to Lisa Grant-Stewart, a counseling psychologist in private practice in Belito, KwaZulu-Natal. She's brain obsessed and has over 10 years experience in the field of neurotherapies and trauma. As part of a collaborative team at, at the Health Matters Practice, which is also where I practice in Belito, she enjoys treating acute and complex PTSD in well-adjusted individuals. A substantial amount of Lisa's work includes the treatment of sexual trauma and the restoration of healthy sexual functioning. And in, I mean, in what I do, the topic of, of sex is so taboo. The, the topic of trauma is, is a difficult one. So I'm really, really excited to kind of bring these two together and um, help individuals to really just start to feel confident and comfortable in these conversations so that people can go and seek help for themselves and advocate for their well-being and, yeah, just just break down that taboo once again in, um, in this difficult conversation. So thank you so much for being here, Lisa. I'm so excited to share your pearls of wisdom with everyone today. <laughs> oh, thanks, Kenz. It's my pleasure and I really look forward to today. Oh, yeah, me too. Okay, so let's get into it. So the one question that I want to ask you, Lisa, is how does trauma impact sexual functioning and how do you, as a psychologist, go about treating this? What can we do? Oh, brilliant. One of my most favorite questions. Um, and as you know, completely brain obsessed um, <laughs> and love everything to do with trauma. So um, I'm going to try and answer this in, in, in quite a broad way with sort of many sort of facets to it. But um, the first is, I think, um, really looking at our understanding of what trauma actually is. So, for example, you know, we look at, um, you know, for example, hijacking as a trauma um, or we, we look at the big things like a hurricane or, a, you know, something along those lines. Mm. But when, when we work in trauma, we actually want to sort of narrow, I mean, we want to broaden that definition um, to include things like, um, you, know, you know, changing jobs, you know, uh, losing a pet. Uh, and then obviously when we're looking at, at sexual trauma, this can be anything sexual related. So it could be, you know, something right from sort of abuse 
uh, to an inappropriate incident, to something that happened between kids a while ago. So mm -hmm. I think we need to just really look at, at um, what is trauma and the fact that we can use it in quite a, a broad way. And yes. in my practice, anything is traumatic when it sort of activates that fight or flight center. Um, so that could also just be sort of simple anxiety because anxiety is a smaller version of, of trauma. Um, so, yeah, just looking at trauma in, a, in quite a broad way. And, and for me, the first thing is just educating people around what is trauma and and yeah. um and that it, it might not be um something um as complex as a as a big um incident it could be something yeah. that we think is quite minor but it can actually have quite a big damage um, on our actual system um, yeah. so that's the first part of 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 looking at this um, and for me, where my passion lies and, and what I've invested a lot of time in is understanding um, and researching and, and working with, you know, sort of modalities that help us to understand what actually happens in a traumatic incident. Um, so many people suffer with huge um, sort of guilt and reactions around um, it could be things like, you know, their partner comes near them and they, they, they get a fright or they tense up or, as you know, can't, uh, lots of pelvic pain or something like vaginismus um, yes. or quite, you know, or just, you know, struggling to have people in their personal space. And what I found is a lot of patients really struggle with the guilt around that. Um, mm. So I, I also start with education around what your brain is actually doing in a traumatic situation that has then resulted in these reactions, the flashbacks, yeah. the, you know, the, the jumpy response, the avoidance that happens. Yes. Um, so basically what, what we now know about trauma, which is quite different uh, to how we used to treat trauma, it used to be very simple, we used to talk a lot, and, and that was about it. Um, but what we now know is that when somebody ex experiences a trauma, it, they've taken way too much um, sort of stimulation from, from the environment. Um, because we're in this sort of survival state, um, all our sort of senses have been activated, um, our limbic system, and I'll show you, I've got a mini brain here in a minute, but our limbic system is activated. And then what happens is that instead of all that sort of information from the environment going nicely through our normal channels, getting processed, um, it actually takes a route that we call, funny enough, the quick and dirty route. Um, and that actually goes straight into your fight or flight center. So I'll just, I'll just sort of show you on here what I mean. Yeah, please. So in, in, when we have sort of normal experiences, you know, all, all these experiences filters through our eyes and our ears and our bodies, and they come through all the senses and they go nicely to the relay centers and then all the way out towards where they should be. Now, yeah. what happens instead in a, in a traumatic episode is that all that information comes in and goes straight into this, which is our see, uh, fight or flight center. So yes. this is our survival center. And because it's such a rapid process and, and all that information is then flagged um, as being dangerous, what actually um, occurs is that all that information um, actually fragments in the brain. So okay. in a lot of our trauma theory, we talk about um, it's as if um, a, a puzzle has been turned upside down, all those fragments have just been thrown in there, and your brain actually battles to understand what has happened. Um, so, if, so you know, if anyone has been through a trauma, and I'm pretty sure anyone listening to this has in some form, you will know that all that information feels far too real. It's way too real. It's activated. Um, you can remember it like it happened yesterday. Um, it's very fresh. And so that, that for me, um, means that this is now sitting in the wrong place. The information that has gone in has gone into the wrong place. It's been flagged as dangerous. Um, and it hasn't been integrated properly. Because the other thing, and this is where memory comes in, within the fight or flight center is our main memory center. So when um, all of this stuff is activated and that area of the brain is activated, it actually um, impacts on our memory, um, A, our memory retrieval, our memory storage, and whether or not we actually integrate those memories. Sure, sure. So, so that, that, that is a big thing with regards to trauma. So now we've got mm. all the sensory stuff, sight, smells, body sensations, 
that have gone into um, gone into our brains, into our survival centers. And most of the time, we just pack that away. It gets shoved to file 13 normally. Um, but as soon as we're in another situation, which is even vaguely similar, could be, um, for example, your husband coming towards you in a certain way, um, and, and that could be you know, quite similar to the original trauma, suddenly you get this reaction and you want to push him away. Yes. And that obviously causes see, huge problems with couples. <laughs> yeah, um, yes, hundred percent. I see this in, in the patients that I that I treat and I mentioned it um in a previous podcast as well, where um I've noticed because I do I read I read people's body language, you know, uh, when I'm working with them, I've noticed if I approach people from a certain side of the bed that might trigger, uh, you know, more of a response, more of a behavioral response, quickening of the breath, um, tensioning, you can see people are just zoning out. And um, if you don't make that association, if you don't realize that that is the reason, then then you feel you feel very lost, you feel that much more out of control, right? You, you don't know. But so if I explain to patients, I'm like, you're most likely having this because it's got some link to the experience that you've had previously. So let's start on the other side. And when you start feeling ready and you, you feel as though you have more control over your behavioral responses, and I'm speaking a lot about vaginismus in this sense, then we can try approach from the other side. And I really find in practice that um, when people are informed, they feel a little bit in control, um, then it's that much more easy to, to start to say, okay, I'm most likely going to feel uncomfortable, but this discomfort is linked to X. Then it's easier to approach and work forward with, um, go forward with, with treatment, etc. It sounds like um, I was wanted to say this a little bit earlier. It sounds like a lot of what you do, Lisa, is going to be validation, um, because, like you said, it can be a small. It can be a small thing, small to one person, but big to you um, that hasn't really been described as trauma. It's not this big physical event that, you know, you would see in a movie and someone would label it as trauma. If it's trauma, if it's traumatic to you and you're not coping with it, then, you know, someone like Lisa would be the one that would kind of help you through that whole process and be like, this is happening because you were traumatized by it. And I see birth trauma, um, a Huge. lot. It, Absolutely it, it falls massive. into that category um, significantly because, it, as we all know, the focus isn't always on the mum, it's focused on, on the baby, and there's no opportunity to really, really process. Um, so, yeah, it sounds like this validation process that you are most likely doing through the education, through the information, is so valu uh, valuable to every person that walks in that door of yours and everyone listening to this episode. <laughs> Absolutely. I'll let you carry I mean, on. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you've hit the nail on the head, and, and and I'm so glad you've you've given some really good examples uh, around you know just being in someone's physical space and then reacting in a way. And I mean, they are completely safe with you. They're coming for their pelvic consult, so there's absolutely no danger whatsoever. But what we can see is how quickly that system is activated, um, and and. And I think one of the biggest things for me is for trauma. So you know, anyone who's had trauma to know that there's nothing they can do about it and they can't think their way out of the situation. And, and I'll tell you why too, is that this is where a lot of our thinking is done. So our good old frontal lobes, a, a higher seat of our intelligence. Um, so this is the part where we like, it's calm down. It's okay. I'm safe. Yes. But what you can actually see is that th that's, the completely wrong area of the brain to be dealing with. This is not the traumatized part. This is. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, you know, as much as we try to tell ourselves that this, you know, this is Candace, she's great. Um, I don't need to be scared. This is my mm. wife. You know, she's wonderful. The, the brain doesn't get that message. Um, mm. And I think people feel really guilty about that. So, yeah, yeah. it's super important that yeah. we understand that. Um, so that obviously, um, that just, you know, it, it makes that difference with, with moving from, from talk therapies into something mm -hmm. where we, we, we getting to the depth of it. There's no, we, we can't always just do this down, this, this, this top down reasoning Perfect. as to, and, and explain it away to ourselves. Be like, no, I'm reacting because of X, mm -hmm. Y, and Z. It's no, we actually need to get deeper and, and, and pro into process mm -hmm. and then integrate it into our behaviors going forward. Amazing. Yeah. 
Yeah, perfect. And, you know, I also wanted to just pick up from uh, the birth trauma that that is such an unspoken area. Um, you know, people don't see birth trauma as um, impacting on them sexually. Um, they don't understand why, you know, you know they, they have reactions after birth. Um, if anything, a lot of my practice is spent uh, dealing with birth trauma because it's not always it's definitely not always sunshine and sunshine and roses as we hope for um and a lot of damage can be done um in in a traumatic birth mm -hmm. so i'm so glad mm -hmm. you mentioned that mm -hmm. um yeah and and, and um Kenz, I'll, yeah absolutely i'll get to the the treatment approaches but i'm glad you you've mentioned the the, the top-down approach um which is again sort of using this area to combat the the fight or flight center um and and what we do um in neurotherapies and i'll, I'll get to that in a moment is we actually go the other way we do a bottom up approach um wow. which then works with the limbic system and then moving it up um but yeah just coming back to sort of sexual functioning in particular so i mean i've, I've sort of spoken about most forms of trauma, but the brain always reacts in, in the same way. It's, it's very predictable. Um, you know, whether it's uh, other trauma, whether it's sexual trauma, but one of the, one of the big things um, that people also don't, don't understand is that in order to be sort of relaxed and, and um, you know, feeling a connection with your partner, engaging in intimacy is that you have to be in, in, in a stage of what we call social engagement. So this, this came from uh, Stephen Porges, who did a lot of research around sort of the three stages. The one is uh, freeze, which is the complete shutdown response. Um, the second is fight or flight, so anxious, you know, wanting to push away. And then, and then the third is, is where we want our patients to be, um, especially, you know, in terms of intimacy, is in the, in the social engagement stage. So, you know, again, in the moment, present, relaxed. And, and what I'm hoping people will now know is that they can't be in that stage um, yeah. if they have experienced either a general trauma, and I'll, I'll come to that in a moment, but particularly a sexual trauma. Um, you now have way too many um, triggers. You're way too activated. Um, so that's the other thing is that people will often come to me and say, why I, I've lost my libido. I'm not interested um, in, in sex at all. What's happened? Um, so one of the big things is that uh, they actually battle to get into that social engagement stage. Um, and I know it's a, it's a, silly example but it's always one that that's worked for me um is that somebody said well you'll never see you'll never see animals in the wild procreating when there's a predator um yeah. because they can't <laughs> yeah. you know so although for humans that so-called predator is imaginary but it, it's all that sort of unresolved activated trauma sort of sitting in the back of our brains and now we're supposed to sort of be present and be in the moment so it's just not going to happen. You know, it's, yeah. it's not physically possible. Oh, yeah. I absolutely <laughs> understand that. You, you get stuck in the stress phase. Um, in, in some of the lectures in the, the la last year's International Society of Women's Sexual Functioning, um, there was a big webinar yes. that was done. They spoke about, about exactly this and how people get stuck in this, this survival mode and there's survival and there's reproductive. And if we, we're so stuck here all the time, how are we supposed to bring ourselves to this? And you can't just switch from one to the other. You need to, you need to have this interplay. And yes, it's good to be in both of them. It, it's, you know, survival mode is not a bad mode. I think things like, like cortisol and stress and, and um, survival mm. and fight and flight, they always have this bad rap because, you know, they're seen as the thing to avoid. They're good. They're there for good yes. reasoning to protect us, to save us, to keep our immune system strong. Um, but we spend too much time there, <laughs> and a lot of us get stuck in on that side of the spectrum. And we need to have the capacity to glide from one side to the other. I had this really um, amazing analogy that was explained to me, and it was a seesaw. Um, so the hinge in the middle, middle is supposed to be well yeah. lubricated and it's supposed to move well. And when the seesaw swings to the one side, it's swinging to almost like reproductive mode. And when it swings to the other side, it's, it's um, swinging to stress mode. But if that hinge in the middle becomes rusted it, because it's now stuck onto mm -hmm. one side, it becomes very difficult to, to hinge back from one side to the other. Mm -hmm. And 
um, that's kind of where we need to start to work. And there's lots of different mechanisms um, to work on that. And um, what you do is definitely playing you know, a huge role in that. Um, but I thought it was quite a, a nice way to, to depict getting stuck in a certain mode. Um, but I'm going to let you carry on because... I can go on. Ab- absolutely. And, and you're 100% right. You know, the brain, the brain's amazing. It's either on or off. You know, it's either safe or not. There's no middle ground. So I, I, I really, yeah, that analogy works because it has to be one way or another, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. We, can, we can never be in a state where we see me safe. Um, we're either safe in our, in our minds and in our bodies or, or we're not. You know, we're in danger. So, yeah. so there really is no um, sort of in between, um, and and exactly that. You know, we we look at um, trauma affecting uh, sort of our sexual functioning in in actually three ways, um, and and the first is the first is the the direct way. So, if somebody has had um, sexual trauma, you know, all of that is sitting there. Their bodies actually, believe it or not, your body has a memory um, of incidents. Um, it can be in all sensory. It could be sight, smells, again, a certain movement, somebody coming, you know, um, or your partner coming to be intimate, um, you know, with you on the one side of the bed. Or So so if you've had um, sexual trauma, there's a, there's a direct triggering um, often of, of all that stimulation. Um, and then the, the second way is, is, is more for people who've experienced sort of general trauma. Um, so, you know, if we've lost our job, um, COVID is happening all over the place. Um, if you've just been through a nasty incident, what what actually happens is that you're still not in social engagement. So although the, the actual um, trauma is not se- sexually based, you you still are battling to to get uh, you know to sort of to get into the zone in order to be vulnerable with your partner, to be completely relaxed. Um, and then, you know, there's, there's a third thing that we need to think about, and we, we see this a lot, and, um, and again, working with the collaborative team here, we see this a lot with um, hormone uh, implications. So way too, way too much cortisol in the system um, actually causes a, ca- a cascade, um, and it actually impacts on hormone function. So yeah. we've got, uh, you know, men with very low testosterone, we've got women with estrogen problems, um, or just, you know, simply too much cortisol. Um, and all of those things would then impact on libido itself. Um, yeah. So those are, those are definitely the, the three different ways. People think it's just one, um, but, uh, but it can actually be three different ways. Yeah, totally, totally resonate with that. And that's why it's so nice, nice to work with a multidisciplinary team where, you know, when you start to realize, oh, okay, so this seems very hormonal, for example, you can go to the GP down the down the corridor and make sure that that person yes. has had bloods and they're getting you know comprehensively managed because that's part and parcel of what we need to do. We need to manage people comprehensively because um, sexual functioning in particular, it's I mean everything. But if we talk about this mm-hmm. topic, it's it's multifactorial. There's so many diff- different facets that that weigh into someone's sexuality, their sexual experience, experience, and we need to make sure that we are addressing all of them because we can't just you know, address one tiny little piece of the pie, um, we need to make sure that all areas are ready to go. Yeah. Yeah, yeah no, absolutely. So yeah, I, I, yeah, the blood work is important. The good old yeah. physicals are important. Um, but then just, you know, with regards to, to other treatment methods, I've, we've alluded to, to treating trauma in a different way um, earlier. Um, but yeah, Kenzie, you're right. In terms of the, you know, the, the one approach, and, and it is used really successfully, um, is, is the, 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 the top-down approach. Um, you know, a lot of my colleagues would use something like um, mindfulness um, or CBT, um, or relaxation in terms of, you know, sort of working with um, e- either working directly with uh, sexual dysfunction or with trauma. And um, for me, and it's it's obviously something I'm very passionate about and very focused on, but for me, it, 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 it just makes sense to, to start at the source and try to correct the, the original um, sort of misfiring of the memory. So in terms of, again, just to, to highlight, in terms of the, the top down, you would use your thinking senses to try and calm the center down. And then the, the two approaches I, I just want to highlight and just bring to people's attention because there's, there's not too much, well, 
luckily they're all gaining momentum now, but people don't know enough about them. Um, the bottom-up approaches really work at trying to fix the center and integrating it with our thinking centers. And then actually it goes back down. So there's now an interplay uh, backwards and forwards, but actually starting right at the bottom first. Um, the first approach that uh, that I use, you know, and I, I just find it uh, really successful, is is the idea of eye movement therapy. Um, there is uh, something called EMDR, which is which is quite sort of a, the famous modality. Um, I tend to use the the lesser known cousin of EMDR, um, which is EMI, which is eye movement integration therapy. And basically what this therapy does is it helps to reintegrate those fragmented pieces of the puzzle, um, you know, that, have, that are causing all these flashbacks and body responses and, you know, jittering or heart rate increasing. Um, and how we do that, um, it, it, it is a little bit complicated, but, uh, you know, once you've had a session, you'll know exactly what it's about. But basically there's a, there's a tiny little structure, but actually right next to our limbic, you know, in our limbic system that controls eye movements. So, so physiologically, there's a tiny little part here that links to memory. And it's also the reason why when we are talking, uh, we are constantly using our eyes to gather information, look up, you know, mm -hmm. look to the side. Uh, there's actually an internal system of, of memory retrieval going on. So what eye movement therapy does is it actually just uses that, that exact system, but in reverse. And, and the process actually ensures that all of those little fragmented memories are unpacked, the emotional content is removed, and through the process of eye movement therapy, all of that stuff, material related to the event, related to the trauma, um, is then moved out of your immediate memory, which is what we call the trigger zone, um, because that's where all your triggers and activation is coming from. And then it moves it to long-term memory, because that's where we need it to be. We need your brain to get the message that you are safe, that that event is over, um, and, that, and that you can be more in the moment. So that's, that's my kind of uh, what I call the shotgun approach um, to treating mm -hmm. trauma. And then there's, a, there's another very successful, very successful therapy with regards to sexual functioning. Um, and that is uh, something called brain working recursive therapy or BWRT, therapy created by Terence Watts in the UK. Um, and brain working therapy is really good and it actually works at a slightly different level of the brain. It actually works further down um, at our reflex centers. Um, a lot of our sexual functioning already comes from, from our limbic system. But what, what BWRT does is it changes the, the response, but right in the reflex center. So um, the way I, uh, my colleagues uh, you know, who do BWRT are much better at explaining this one. Um, but for me, what what, what it does is actually neutralizes either traumatic memories or it's really good in those moments when we need to change a response. Um, so instead of, you know, clenching, you know, your pelvis, um, you know, when, when your partner's becoming uh, intimate, we actually insert a response of you're safe or you can relax and you can just kind of take it easy from there. Um, so those, there, there are other neurotherapies, but but these are these are the ones I, I I talk to a lot and use sort of interchangeably with clients. Yes, and I mean I know from from our, our working together that they most certainly are effective methods. So these neurotherapies, if if this is you and you feel as though you know talk therapy has been an amazing part of your journey and it's helped you but there's something mm. there's some kind of wall that you just or speed bump that you're not able to get past then something do your research look a little bit further into bwrt and emi and the neurotherapies that are available out there because they're game changers they really really can take um and it's not it's not the longest process you know it's you know, I, I know that you don't see patients like over and over and over again unless it's necessary. No. Um, but you know, it's something that can really be managed quite timeously. Um, so it's it's beautiful to see that that we're really looking deeper into this um, concept of what wires to get what fires together wires together, and really trying to to break that association. Like we were saying, someone approaches you from from the right side and, and you get this response, you may not have 
put that those two together but now we can start mm -hmm. to see okay that happened so now if someone approaches me or surprises me or whatever from that side because your brain has made that association and tied those two experiences together now your your body or your brain reacts to that as if you are in that moment again and that's where we can use something like these neurotherapies to really make a significant impact um, and significant change um, i'm clearly getting excited about this because i know how effective it can be um, but uh, I'm, I'm going to ask you just if, if Lisa, if you can just kind of refresh our memory so that we can integrate this knowledge as well as as, as much as we possibly can. Um, just give us a bit of a summary so we can just be like, oh, yes, that's what Lisa said. I'm going to go do some more research. I'm going to get in touch with her um, <laughs> so we can feel like we've on the ball. Perfect. Yeah, that's that's awesome. Um, so yeah, I mean, I mean, I guess you know, sort of take home messages um, for anyone listening, and yeah, anyone who can spread the word is please treat your trauma. Um, it really is a big thing, and it can be done quickly, effectively. You're not going to need to rehash things over and over again because that that in itself is activating and traumatic. So we try and get in there, fix it, and and get out. So you know, so that you can go on your merry way. Um, and then also just, just to really understand that these symptoms were originally there to protect you, you know, so they're not your enemy. Um, and I'm hoping you'll understand where they're coming from now. And then, yeah, just the last one is, is, is really just to look at, at neurotherapies for the treatment of trauma um, and investigate, you know, there's, there's plenty of um, sort of information um, on the net, especially around BWRT. Um, eye, eye movement integration therapy is is there if you if you Google it, um, but it's EMI therapy, not EMI the music label. And um, yeah, so, so yeah, otherwise you're welcome to get in touch with me um, at Health Matters in Belito. Um, um, yeah, if you, if you just uh, hop, hop onto Google or just Google my name and you'll find all my details, Lisa Grant Stewart. Um, yeah, so please, everyone, treat your trauma um, so that you can start enjoying first your life and secondly your sex life. And I don't know which one would actually go first at this point. <laughs> Divine. <laughs> Thank you so much, Lisa, for your pearls of okay. wisdom. Um, I, I know that there are going to be many people out there that are super grateful to to hear this, to to hear your validation and the and to learn that there are options out there for them. Um, so yeah, thank you so much. Have a beautiful you are so remainder welcome. of your day. Yeah. <laughs> you too. Well, NurturePod listeners, until next time, please review and subscribe. And as always, stay curious. As a special treat for listening to today's episode, you can head over to the nurturepelvichealth.com website and use the code NurturePod for 20% discount on all pelvic and sexual health courses. Let's indulge in a gift from Guided by Glow, whose mission it is to create a transformational practice of awakening your sensual feeling body, igniting your imagination, and cultivating a positive and thriving sexual relationship with yourself. Try today and take $20 off your annual membership using promo code NURTURE. Go to guidedbyglow.com or find it in the app store.